Okay, hi everybody, my name is Carmel Hicks. I am a software engineer at Atlassian and I'm here today to speak to you about multi-tenant architectures in 20 minutes. So by the end of the presentation, I'd like for you to be able to answer three questions. What is a multi-tenant architecture and why would you use one? How can you connect your customers to their data within a multi-tenant architecture if every customer has their own database? And what are three things to consider when building a low latency, highly available application that serves critical data? So in order to get you to the stage that you can answer all of those questions, I'm going to be running you through a couple of things. We're going to start off with the history of Atlassian Cloud, and then we'll move, then move on to speak about multi-tenant architectures and what they actually are. We'll then be speaking about how we at Atlassian connected our customers to their data within a multi-tenant architecture. And we'll be breaking that down into three different phases, designing, building, and refining. We'll then finish up on a reflection on what we think we probably could have done a bit differently and a summary at the end. So to start off with the history of Atlassian Cloud, but just to, before we get too far into things, there might be a couple of you sitting there thinking, what's Atlassian? Well, at Atlassian, we specialize in building collaboration software to unleash the potential in every team. That means that we're responsible for building tools such as Jira, Confluence, Trello, and Bitbucket. So in the beginning, Atlassian was a server company, which just meant that we built our tools in-house and then bundled them up. We then had our customers come and purchase those little bundles and it would then be up to them to unwrap them, set them up and run and maintain them on their own servers. Now, after a little bit of time, cloud started to become a pretty big deal and our customers started to express to us that they were having a hard time running and maintaining their own servers. So we figured, well, why don't we just run and maintain the servers and then our customers can just access them. And that's exactly what we did. We essentially deployed server products up in the cloud and that became our cloud offering. So this is what is known as a single tenant architecture where a tenant is just a cloud customer. So in Atlassian's case, that would typically be an entire company. Now single tenant architecture model is a model where a single compute node can serve a single tenant. And this is because those compute nodes are stateful, which means that they have pre-existing knowledge of the tenants that they're able to serve. And to be honest, we got really good at doing single tenant architectures. We did this for many, many years and we were really able to get the most out of this infrastructure. But when we scaled to tens of thousands of customers, we started to run into some problems. For example, if a compute node were to go down, that would mean that an entire customer somewhere and all of their users would be completely unable to access their instance. Upgrades became pretty problematic because if we had tens of thousands of customers, that meant that we had tens of thousands of compute nodes and we had to go through and apply an upgrade to every single one of them. And upgrades are complex and time consuming processes and they required downtime, which meant that we had to perform our upgrades during our tenants maintenance windows. And given that we had customers all over the world, that would actually take us 24 hours to roll out an upgrade to production. And so you can imagine that's a pretty big deal if we're trying to roll out a critical fix for a security bug. Finally, cost. At the end of the day, Atlassian is a business and we care about where we spend our money. And with this single tenant architecture, we were scaling by the number of customers. And that doesn't necessarily correlate to usage. That meant that we were paying the same amount of money for some fairly large customers who were coming back and visiting us all the time Whereas we were, as we were for smaller customers who weren't actually using any of the resources that we had provisioned for them. Basically, we said, oh, there has to be a better way. And this is where the multi-tenant architecture came in. But what is a multi-tenant architecture? Well, if a single tenant architecture is just a model where a single tenant can be served by a single compute node, a multi-tenant architecture is just a model where any tenant can be served by any compute node. And this is possible because those compute nodes are stateless, which means that they can figure out all of the information they need to know on the fly. And this is awesome for a couple of different reasons. To begin with, it unlocks horizontal auto scaling, which just means that if some of those compute nodes start to become a little bit strained, we can just add more nodes to the pool. And this allows for you to scale by usage instead of number of customers. If one of those compute nodes were to go down in our single tenant architecture, that means a customer can't access their instance. In our multi-tenant architecture, we just take that compute node out of the pool. Finally, with upgrades, multi-tenant architectures give you the ability to spin up new compute nodes running the latest version of the software, and when they're ready, you just switch the traffic over and you have yourself a zero downtime upgrade. So in Australia, this is what we would refer to as bloody beautiful. 
So we figured, all right, we'll quickly go over to Jira and Confluence and quickly switch them over to multi-tenant architectures. And that's exactly what we did. It just took us dozens of teams to perform over 15,000 tasks over the space of three years. So why is that? Well, it all comes down to legacy. At the end of the day, Jira and Confluence have been around for almost 16 years now. And 16 years ago, Millions of lines of code under the assumption that we could do things such as cache tenant data and connect the database directly to the compute node. And in order to make the multi-tenant architecture work, we had to go through and make a lot of changes because all of this constitutes as state. And we also had to build supporting infrastructure to make the whole thing work in the first place. And so that's what we'll be focusing on for the rest of this talk, which was some of the infrastructure that we had to build to support our customers and how we would connect them to their data within this new architecture. So we'll be focusing first on how we designed to solve this problem. So in the beginning, we wanted to build a multi-tenant database. And the idea here is that you put all of your customers' data within one database. And then the compute node would figure out what information to fetch based on the context of the request. But we were already amongst a really, really large and risky project. And so we started to sit down and investigate some ways that we could cut scope and reduce risk, but also deliver as much value to our customers as possible. And at that point in time, we decided that a multi-tenant database just wasn't the best thing to do. And so we decided to compromise and we stuck with our single tenant per single database model. But this gave us a new problem to solve because we now had tens of thousands of databases but only a handful of compute nodes. And we need to tell each compute node which database to connect to dynamically. To handle this, we built a new service called the Tenant Context Service, or TCS. And the idea with the TCS is that it would provide a lookup at runtime. For example, if we were to have a tenant make a request, one of the compute nodes would receive that request and then send it over to the TCS. And it would say, okay, show me Sarah's company.atlassian.net. The TCS would then receive that host name, and because host names are unique, it could perform an order of one lookup and get all of the tenant configuration. So tenant configuration in this case is what type of products the tenant has, how many users, and the database details. So it sends the database information back to the compute node, and the compute node can now resolve the request. So this seems easy enough, aside from the fact that we've just introduced a lookup into every single request that is made in Jira and Confluence Cloud. And to put that into perspective, that's actually over 30,000 requests per second. And so that meant we needed to be pretty careful with how we built this thing. It needed to be really, really fast. We didn't want people to even realize this lookup was happening. It had to be incredibly highly available because if that TCS went down, that was an outage in Atlassian Cloud. It had to be incredibly highly scalable because 30,000 requests per second was a number that was only going to continue to increase. And finally, it had to be strongly consistent because this is tenant configuration, which is really critical data. And so we wanted to be completely sure that we had a single source of truth that gave us an accurate representation of what any of our tenants look like at any point in time. But we start to run into some problems when we look at these three requirements because we've just asked for low latency, high availability, and strong consistency. And that's actually not possible according to the PAC ELC theorem, which states that in the case of a petition, you have to choose between availability and consistency. Else, choose between latency and consistency. So for those of you familiar with the CAP theorem, this is just an extension of that. For everybody else, there's just a whole bunch of words which basically says you have to make compromises if you want availability, consistency, and consistency. But luckily for us, we aren't the only people to ever run into this problem. There is a pattern known as CQRS, which stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation. Again, a lot of fancy words basically just means don't build one thing, build two. And that means you can optimize accordingly. So you have one model for your commands or your updates and another model for your queries or your reads. And the idea there is that your commands model can then be the strongly consistent single source of truth, whereas your reads model can be highly available with lower latency. Worth noting here that because we now have two systems in this design, it does take a little bit of time to get data from one place to the other. And that means you have yourself an eventually consistent, eventually consistent solution. 
However, in our particular scenario, that was okay. As long as we had that consistency somewhere, we were happy to pay that price of the eventual consistency for our TCS. And so we decided to adopt this pattern and we built the TCS, but we also pulled out the requirement of strong consistency and built the catalog service as well. So we now had a pretty good pattern to follow, so we just needed to build the thing. But when we look at our two services, we realize we're just trying to do two things. Store unique configuration data, and serve unique configuration data. And at the end of the day, that's really just a key value store. So this meant that Amazon Web Services DynamoDB was a really good fit for this use case. So we got ourselves a DynamoDB table. However, out of the box, AWS guarantees that DynamoDB will be available for 99.99% .99 of the time, which correlates to about four minutes of downtime per month at worst. And that's okay, especially for something like the catalog service, where we're not optimizing for availability. But for something like the TCS, that's not really going to cut it. That's okay, because an easy way to increase your availability is to introduce redundancy. And that's exactly what we did. We got ourselves not one, but three DynamoDB tables, and they were deployed into three different geographic locations, or AWS regions. And the idea here is that if one of those tables were to fail, the other ones can then take over. And this actually brings us up to a theoretical table availability of six nines, which is closer to three seconds of downtime per month. And that's starting to sound a lot better. The multi-region deployment gave us an added benefit of reduced network latency. Let's say we were to have a tenant and they were located in Europe. And they were constantly making requests to a TCS that was over in Western USA. They could be incurring 80 milliseconds of network overhead alone. This is before they even hit the service. Alternatively, they could just hit the TCS in Europe and incur only seven milliseconds of network overhead. However, this did mean that we needed to find a solution that could get our data from our single source of truth out to our TCS stacks. It needed to be something that could propagate data to multiple different regions. It needed to guarantee ordering, because if you think about us receiving a request to deactivate a product and then a request to activate a product, let's say we were to get that order incorrect. The impact there is that we would have customers paying for products and completely unable to access them, and that was just not gonna fly. And finally, it had to be real time. Because I mentioned before, we're making these trade-offs with eventual consistency, but at the end of the day, we're talking in the scope of milliseconds. For the vast majority of the time, we don't want people to even realize there's two systems going on in the background. So for us, this meant that Kinesis Streams provided by AWS was a really good fit. And because it not only allowed for multiple different re uh, readers from all over the world, but it also guaranteed that your records would be delivered in order at least once. And it was gonna do it fast. So we got ourselves a Kinesis stream. But we now needed something that would write to the Kinesis stream only upon successful persistence and likewise read from the stream and write it to the TCS tables, which meant that we needed some compute. So at this point in time, we got ourselves a couple clusters of EC2 nodes and they would scale depending on the load that we received. With this in place, we were able to have the catalog service receive a request, write it to its table, and then upon successful persistence, put that information onto the stream. Our TCS stacks from all over the world would be listening to that stream and they would then be able to pick up that information and persist them to their own tables. Now, with all of this in place, we were able to satisfy all of our requirements. However, this is software. And typically when you want to build something, it doesn't always work out quite as you planned the first way around. So we had to spend a little bit of time refining our solution. And to be honest, there were quite a number of problems we had to solve. For example, we had cases where we redeployed the TCS at a high load period and our load balancer didn't scale up fast enough. So we needed to start looking into things like pre-warming the load balancers. We had cases where AWS had an outage and entire records would be dropped to one of the TCSs. And whilst that's okay because the other TCS stacks would be able to take over, it did mean that we had to write a tool which was capable of reading all of the information from the single source of truth, making a modification, writing it back, and then flushing that information through the stream to get us back into a consistent state. However, the biggest problem we had to solve was with regards to caching. This is a real graph from the TCS average latency at around November last year. And I'm speaking about average instead of something like P99, purely because I don't have a screenshot of any other metric from that time. So we'll go with average. Anyway, so you can see here that we're sitting at about five milliseconds of latency. And then pretty much out of nowhere, we started to skyrocket. This was one second of latency for the TCS. 
Upon investigation, we realized this was actually due to an internal problem that AWS were having, where DynamoDB slowed down significantly and was taking a really, really long time to respond. This meant that all of our EC2 nodes were sitting there waiting for DynamoDB to get back to them, and then requests for the TCS started to time out. So we figured, all right, no worries, we'll just reduce the number of times we hit DynamoDB in the first place, and we can do that by introducing a cache. And caching in this sense, in this case, made a lot of sense because these records were accessed all the time, but they were actually changed very infrequently. However, given the type of data that we were serving, we could only cache if we could reliably invalidate. And that's where it became a little bit more complicated because we don't have just one cache, we've got a cluster of caches. And that meant we had some issues if we were to have, for example, a request come in to make a change. One node would receive that request and make the change to the DynamoDB table. It handled the request so it knows to invalidate its cache. However, everything else in the pool has got no idea that anything has happened. To handle this, we added a simple notification service, which is AWS's published subscription solution. Basically, the idea here is that when a request is received, it would still write it to the table and invalidate its cache. It then would, however, notify SNS that something has happened and SNS could then broadcast that change event to all of our nodes and they would then know to invalidate their caches as well. So after rolling this out, we didn't actually just see our incident go away, but we saw a dramatic decrease in our overall latency of the service. And in fact, this was so successful server-side that we decided to roll this out client-side as well. And the average TCS latency has dropped to about zero now because no one even hits the thing anymore. However, this does bring us on to a reflection on what we think we probably could have done a bit differently, because if we were to have our time again, we probably would have taken caching a little bit more seriously from the very beginning. A lot of our caches were added quite reactively when things started to break. But this was fundamentally due to the fact that we were quite scared to cache this type of data. As Phil Carton once said, there are two hard problems in computer science, cache invalidation and naming things. And this was very much the case for us. We were very scared that we would get the invalidation wrong and that we would serve stale tenant configuration data indefinitely. However, when it became clear to us that the benefits were going to outweigh the risks, and yeah, sure, caching is hard, but it's not impossible, and we had a pretty good idea of how we would go about it, we decided to move forward with it not just once, but twice. And that would have probably been the best thing that we've done for the TCS to date. Nevertheless, despite all the problems we had to solve since December 2017, the TCS has been behind every single Jira and Confluence request in the cloud. And this also marked the end date of our big multi-tenant move all the things to AWS project. All right, so at the beginning of the presentation, I said I'd like for you to be able to answer three questions. What is a multi-tenant architecture and why would you use one? Well, it's just a model where any tenant can be served by any compute node. And you use them because they enable awesome things such as horizontal auto-scaling so that you can scale by load, enhance resilience, and zero downtime upgrades. How can you connect your customers to their data within a multi-tenant architecture if every customer has their own database? Well, in our case, we just introduced a lookup table that was able to resolve tenant configuration on every request based on a unique identifier, such as a host name. And finally, what are three things to consider when building a low latency, highly available application that serves critical data? Well, you can introduce redundancy to reduce latency and increase availability. You can harness CQRS to mitigate PAC ELC, and you can cache aggressively as long as you invalidate intelligently. Great, thank you so much for listening. <laughs>